Gal. Hey guys and welcome to Kunai. It's your boy Bish and I'm joined by Will. Hello, Will. Hi Will, how are you? How are you doing? Um, I'm fairly good. Little 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 bit on the, the groggy side today. It's kinda chilly and rainy here today, so yeah, but other than that I'm good. If I'm not mistaken, it's early in the morning in Japan at the moment. Uh as of time of this recording, it is eight twenty AM my time. On a typical work day I would be like kinda just starting my day. We would have just started our like morning meeting at work. You know what? It's eleven twenty here, so I'm almost ready to go to sleep. But you know what? Forget about sleep. Forget about work. It's not one of them days. It's a Saturday no. today. And we're going to be talking about Assassination Classroom. Ass Class. Ass Class. Exactly. The meme. The name Ass Class. Uh, but before we get into it, I just want to go on to our disclaimer. For you new folks, Get Life Podcast Kunai is a monthly anime discussion podcast under the Gal Network. It's a network now, guys. We are sponsored by Sugoi Mart and Crunchyroll. Of course, you can watch Assassination Classroom on Crunchyroll or on Funimation, depending on where you want to watch it. Be sure to support the show by checking out our sponsors. In addition to that, if you do want to suggest a show for Kunai, make sure it is one season and underneath 30 episodes, because you know what? We've got our lives to attend to. This show was actually like 22 episodes, I believe. So it did take us quite a while to get to it. I'll take it back to myself here with this. Just so you guys know, Ass Class is... Oh, it cracks me up every time I call it Ass Class. But you know what? It's the name of the show. <laughs> Ass Class is a sci-fi comedy anime based on the manga by Yusei Matsui. Directed by Seiji Kishi, who directed Angel Beats, Persona 4, The Animation, Danganronpa, Classroom of the Elite to name a few. Animated by Studio Lurch, who's also worked on Danganronpa, uh, Monster Musume, Classroom of the Elite, as well as one of my personal favorites, Asobi Asobesei, I think is the name of it. The first season of Ass Class began simulcasting in winter 2015, alongside Idol Master Cinderella Girls, Seikano, How to Raise a Boring Girlfriend, Death Parade, as well as uh, Sengoku Muso, the anime adaptation for Samurai Warriors. Safe to say, there wasn't much competition that season. I'm not sure, Will, if I've missed out any other things that was airing that season. But to be fair with you, it, it feels like this show was carrying that season. For, for me, it would be a little bit different because I did not watch the show when it was airing. I like going over what was airing that season. Probably my favorite shows that were airing that season were Absolute Duo, which unfortunately tanked, but I love that show. And then the second season of Durara. Oh, okay. To be fair with you, around this time, it was a bit weird for me because when I started getting into anime, and bear in mind, we were actually recording Kunai in this time. I think we were three years into Kunai. So I was familiar with anime, but I was kind of just watching my romance anime, watching comedies or rom-coms, that kind of stuff. So Ass Class wasn't something that was on my radar at all, to be fair with you. But at the same time, 2015 doesn't feel like the year for shonen i know that there were some really big shonen shows that came later on in the year you know danmachi aired for the first time one punch man towards the end of the year and things like that but i kind of felt like shonen wasn't really in as much as it is today around that time i don't know if that's a fair assumption to make no honestly i was gonna mention something about it too where where i kind of got that feeling too like i'm sitting here thinking about some of the shows that i watched in 2015 and how like on you know uh our earlier episode where we did uh, gate you know that was probably you know one of my overall top shows of 2015 but outside of that yeah there wasn't a lot of like really high high profile stuff i remember there were a lot of people that were into death parade wouldn't really count that as shonen but it kind of fell into that wheelhouse along with like tokyo ghoul so i remember like some of my co-workers and such that are your your kind of more for lack of better words average anime viewers that you know pretty much watch on it's like on toonami or whatever is like put out there and hyped up like they were like uh, assassination classroom was a show they were into tokyo ghoul and death parade that's why those kind of like stick in my mind around this this time being the ones hyped up and of course one punch man as well it's very interesting that you mentioned 
mentioned Toonami because in more recent years, Assassination Classroom has seen a resurgence, which yeah, I didn't you really expect that. that. That to me before, and I was like, really? Yeah. I had noticed it during uh, COVID and it was trending on Twitter and I was like, what the hell is going on? Like, I was just like, what? And it had turned out that they were airing the Funimation dub for the first time on Toonami. You know, Toonami's Adult Swim block and stuff like that. And I was just like amazed by it because it was like, this is a show from 2015. Like shows like that, especially older shows, don't get that much love, especially on Toonami, right? It was nice to see. I'm I'm presuming they probably sub from Funimation really cheaply because, you know, it is an older show. The hype for it has died down. But it kind of brings me on to my first impressions because to be honest with you, I kind of knew about Ass Class because at the time, you know, we were three years into Kunai, as I mentioned. I'd become very comfortable with manga and anime and to be fair I was collecting more like American comics at the time Marvel stuff and I would frequent the local comic book store with my friends and they had a small manga section but there was a lot of assassination classroom stuff I would say I and I remember around this time too was about the time where like at least where where I'm from how manga was just really starting to kind of like I don't want to say blow up but the gears were in motion for it to start getting more like I remember uh, like where I'm I, I'm from we're kind of lucky we have like three kind of really big bookstores and a couple smaller mom and pop shops but even like those big major bookstores their manga section every time I'd go in it seemed like it got bigger and bigger and bigger yeah it's very interesting because for me I mean at least in the UK at this time manga wasn't really popular and you know, now you can go into any sort of Waterstones or like any sort of major bookstore. You you will find manga and there'll be a considerable uh, manga section. You know, you've got your My Heroes, One Punch, Attack on Titan, that kind of stuff, mostly shonen. But when I was in the comic book store, there wasn't that much manga. But what was there was just a shit ton of Assassination Classroom. And I remember it very vividly because the covers did not tell you what was in the book if that makes sense like it was just koro sensei's face and it had different backgrounds oh yeah i remember seeing those now that you bring that up because i've never actually checked out the manga but i definitely remember seeing it on the shelves and it just being his face you're absolutely right it was it was just so weird to me i was just like well i'm not really gonna read this i didn't know what it was that face creeped me out so i was just like okay look i'm not gonna get into manga i'm just gonna buy my wolf Green comics and my X-Men comics and that's it. <laughs> so it's it's kind of worth noting that at the time, like I mentioned, the manga itself had a lot of fans in the UK, which surprised me, really. Fun fact, I was never going to watch the show if it wasn't for Kunai. I had no interest in Assassination Classroom. Back then, I was kind of into that vibe, and I, I still am, in a sense. I don't really watch hyped-up shows because I don't want to get involved in that conversation on Twitter. People tend to argue, and you really don't get to see the best side of the show. Sometimes when you're watching the simulcast and other people are sort of getting involved and bringing their own opinions into things right so we kind of leave it until the season has ended to then watch the show when the sort of hype has settled but we watched it for kunai because joe suggested it in fact it was their second ever anime suggestion on kunai and we planned on airing it between excel world and another and we tried to record in september it was a long time ago september 2016 but you know what and this is a funny thing if you go back to the excel world episode we did mention hey guys the next episode is gonna be assassination classroom but you know what we fucked it up for ourselves because i had a great idea to call kevin and joe the night before to run through our notes and long story short we got really hyped for the show and we ended up speaking for i think four hours just discussing everything and we went through our notes in hyper detail but we didn't record the session right because we were thinking oh well you know what we're gonna record the tomorrow's session or whatever we got to the next day and about 15 minutes into the episode maybe 30 minutes into the episode we were like we already know everything we know everyone's reactions we know everyone's notes this isn't fun and we learned a valuable lesson that day that on kunai we like to have fun and make content that we enjoy making right and we cancelled the episode 
opting never to reschedule because our initial discussion was very very amazing in my personal opinion i and i remember it to this day i know there's kind of a lot of backstory here but kind of before i get into my first impressions i just wanted to mention it because it's almost 10 years of kunai and i think this is kind of history behind the scenes of the show so how did you manage to rope me into this then (laughs) so the real the real reason why i decided to get you on for this episode was because i remember back in the day where me and joe and kevin decided not to ever cover it again and i as you guys know we did denki guy recently and that was also another cancelled episode so my plan really was to cover all of these cancelled episodes there's three in total denki guy assassination classroom and uh, neon genesis evangelion and those three episodes i wanted to do before kunai's 10th anniversary because it pains me that we had to cancel those episodes and i felt that well will hasn't seen the show before i haven't seen it in what since six years almost so it's enough time for me to sort of forget about the show especially because there wasn't any hype around it no one has been talking about it for a while so my second watch or the second time watching it for kunai for this recording was kind of like a fresh recording to begin with right because i even lost my original notes i don't have them anymore because i i write my notes on on paper i don't know if you guys knew like a few years back my my room sort of collapsed in on itself like the roof collapsed and the ceiling it it was a whole big issue but i lost a lot of my documents my original documents for kunai i lost the assassination classroom notes unfortunately again just like Deki guy i'm glad that i could help Hope you finally get to this yeah well you know what i'm glad that we're having you on for it because i wanted to talk about it on kunai because you know getting a fresh pair of eyes on it and to kind of give the show a kunai episode it deserves and hopefully we can do that today on to my first impressions i didn't know what the show would be you know from the title it, it's very elusive right because i assumed that the students would be training to be assassins i didn't stop to think that they would be assassinating their teacher and for a type of show i normally don't watch that premise hooked me in right i wanted to know more about koro sensei who was he is he an alien why is he going to destroy the earth why is he teaching these students and more importantly why does he care for them and want them to improve and succeed despite the fact that society saw these kids as low lives and losers there was a lot of things that kind of intrigued me you know those little hints that you get throughout the show and i was just invested from that point just trying to figure out the story it's very very interesting because there's not that many shonen shows that do that right a lot of them is just all about like you know battle shonen like dragon ball or a show like ultimate muscle or you know even my hero academia and stuff like that it's all about the fights there's not much strategy there's not much sort of detective work going on in the background and at that time you know i've been playing games like danganronpa and persona 4 games that do have that level of sort of detective story elements to it and part of me just wanted to unravel this story and that's why i kind of stayed watching i will say this i wasn't disappointed well i want to know what your first impressions were because obviously this show is completely new to you but i'd imagine that you would have known more about it online and things like that yes and no so i i i've said about uh assassination classroom that for me it was always one of those series that just kind of like slipped through the cracks for me i had co-workers and friends that were you know watching it you know one of my co-workers she was even reading the manga and she would like say you really should check this out you really should check this out and but i just kind of always shied away from it for some reason you know i don't really know why i mean it's i will say it is one of those shows that's a little bit out of my wheelhouse of what i you know typically do enjoy and watch and everything so it was really interesting when you suggested that this should be something that you know i should check out at least for kunai if nothing else i just went into it blind i was like you know i don't really want to look into it you know i knew touches of it here and there just because of the age of the show and like i said because of co-workers and friends watching it but i just i loaded up the first episode and i said let me check this out just see what it's like off the bat and everything when i was watching it one of the first things that actually stood out to me was the actual art style i was like man i can't quite put my finger on this but i know this art style and it's actually an art style that i like like i always describe it to people as being like the thick 
and heavy like black lines mm -hmm. like a lot of like that more traditional manga style you know because it's in black and white where they have those those heavier deeper blacks and then, like i said it's it's a style that i actually really like and the first thing that jumped out to me too with that was how it reminded me of uh, i always mispronounce it but uh danganronpa mm -hmm. okay and then of course after the the episode you know the first episode was over i said okay i said i want to see who actually makes this and that's when and yeah i saw the lurch logo but at first i didn't put two and two together but then when i looked at the staff and so i'm like oh this is like the same staff as mm -hmm. thing on Rompa, basically correct um so i mean yeah most of the same people that were involved in that were involved in this and like i will say just to drop like another show out there that i really like that to me has this very similar style is drifters if you've ever seen that mm -hmm. like i just i don't know why i like that really heavy you know not just the blacks but just i don't want to say bright colors but where the colors are so deep that you notice them like the colors in the show stand out when they're juxtaposed to the blacks and the darks so that's it for for for, for just the art style but i'm just just like you i had like the same kind of reaction when i wanted to know more about koro sensei i was mm -hmm. to me though it was more like i don't i couldn't understand why he was going through the trouble of teaching these kids that are the quote unquote rejects and caring for them where like ultimately their goal is to kill him and if he doesn't then he's gonna blow up the world just like he did the moon and like this it just it was really really off-putting i don't want to say off-putting it was it felt unbalanced mm -hmm, to me mm -hmm. like the entire time i was watching the show too and i saw him interacting with the with the kids it's like why is he doing this when he could potentially just be turning around and killing them in the end anyway i thought him as a character was both intriguing but also kind of awkward with some of his mannerisms and the way that his like face changed color and things like that i also think it's a little bit of an interesting show where from 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 the get-go from the early moments of the show i don't think there is a clear cut this is you know the main character yeah. you know what i mean i mean it's kind of set up like a little bit like that with nagisa but it's not he's not the guy from the jump of the show you know and i had mixed reactions so i'm gonna put this in comparison to something more recent so i started watching chainsaw man okay. and like you i tend to avoid you know those super hype shows and everything i was like but i said this seems interesting the the concept seems interesting let me check it out so just like with assassination classroom but it's one of those shows where i want to know more about the characters mm -hmm. it's not necessarily the world or the overarching story but it's the characters that intrigue me and where i just want to know what's more of their story and why are they doing this so that was basically my first impression um it's very interesting that you mentioned and i know i'm kind of jumping the gun a little bit here but i really want to go back onto what you said in regards to the way that there isn't any main character in the story at least in the in the beginning and it's very interesting it's because the way the show is structured right because it kind of feels as though each character does get i know there's like 28 students in the season but it feels as though each character does get a level of character development whether it's a full episode or a mini arc within a particular episode and you actually get to see each one of the characters shine their abilities their weaknesses their interests and things like that and i think that's mainly down to the way that the story is structured so it is quite interesting that you mentioned that. I mean, it's not something that is usual when it comes to anime, especially shonen anime. Obviously, now there is that level of trope of um, shonen battle anime that's sort of set in a school. If we're looking at stuff like Mob Psycho or My Hero Academia, right? That's, you know, kids in a school with superpowers fighting villains. It's kind of like that. And that's kind of become more predictable as years go on. But I think what's very interesting about the show, at least initially at the time, even when I was watching it, because I didn't watch it simulcasted. I watched it a year after. At that time, I didn't really come across a show like this before. Do you know what I mean? It was very unique. Even to me, watching this later, like, I don't even really compare it to a show like My Hero Academia. This this show just does come off as being very unique. Like, even in the years of watching anime since this show first came out, I, I can't really pin it against any, any one other show, to be honest. The only reason I'm bringing up My Hero Academia is it's mainly because they're shown in jump shows right and they 
both have school students and stuff like that but it is quite different even the level of hype i keep on going back to the level of hype in the show like i remember this shit was always talked about like people could not get enough of it and it's kind of died down and it upsets me a little bit you know i'm glad to see that there's that resurgence on tsunami and stuff i think it's a good place to talk about our favorite episodes and moments because that's one of the reasons i love the show there's just in my personal opinion will and maybe you can disagree with me i found that there was no episode that i actually hated every episode even the ones that were more like fan servicey episodes or episodes that are just considered filler they were still really good right they were just amazing episodes i didn't feel like any episode was shit i will actually agree a little bit with that sentiment i remember because i mean i just you know watched it to, to leading up to this recording just so it would all still be fresh in my mind and everything there were no episodes that i could say man i really hated this episode but at the same time there were like some episodes where also like i, I don't want to say it was boring but it was like the episode was just kind of there now i will say like i will say that overall like episodes that i took note notes on and in, in some kind of form whatever i took you know to to maybe mention while we're talking is 15 out of these 22 episodes so that's still a really good portion that i can say that i enjoyed or i was invested in those episodes okay so it's interesting that you mentioned obviously the 15 out of the the 22 episodes but which one would you say was your least favorite because i know you know we can go on and talk about our favorite episodes in a bit but i'm intrigued to know what was your least favorite episode probably my least favorite just because i felt it was like super awkward would have been uh, episode 13 where we got to meet takako sensei okay uh, yeah yeah to takauka sensei the the gym teacher Takauka, yeah, yeah and he was like call me daddy i'm like and just him literally like beating the crap out of the kids yeah that episode to me was just was super awkward and a little bit difficult to watch okay to that's interesting because i didn't kind of feel like that when i was watching that episode i'm not sure if it's down to a translation error but when i watched it his logic made sense right he was very nice and kind at the beginning and he kind of treated it like hey we're a family here and because one of the students actually mentioned it themselves they were like oh it's like you're a dad you know you're making you know dad jokes you're laughing you know it's kind of like you're our dad and then he was like yeah i am i can see where you're coming from will but it was like yeah i am your dad and what family doesn't listen to their father and he was being very firm and i kind of understood the logic yes it is kind of creepy in a sense but i understood the logic that he was trying to portray he was trying to show that level of dominance that level of look i'm the one that's in control and it does come off a little bit weird don't get me wrong and the fact that he was beating the shit out of the kids i didn't quite expect that when i saw that you know when he just beats the shit out of him i can't remember what their names were mahera san uh, he and i think i can't remember the girl that he beat up kanazaki the idol i think yeah so i didn't think that he would beat them up like that like he winded the first kid and he just bitch slapped the girl i was just like fuck and also the reason why i was so i'm gonna be a little bit biased here obviously because you know I, i'm i'm a teacher and everything and when you had like karasuma sensei and koro sensei okay. when they were just kind of like sitting on the sidelines at first and they were like no no let this play out i'm like what why aren't you intervening mm -hmm. and it was like and, and the fact that like it was karasuma sensei that even brought the guy in in the first place you know karasuma i don't think he necessarily brought the guy in i think it was just like well he knew the government knew was him. yeah he knew him i mean the government were the ones that were like oh we want to lighten up your workload so we brought this guy in to help you and obviously he's already known him and this is the funny thing it's like he knows him from the army this is the one thing that is i'll say it's a gripe that i have with this episode there's an inconsistency because he knew him from the army yet he like googled him or or like searched him up on a government database where he's like beating the shit out of his subordinates in the army and i was like how is that not like a crime wouldn't he be like like court-martialed for that in the army right firstly and secondly how did karasuma like if karasuma was with him in the army how did he not know that like he should have known from the beginning that this guy was going to be trouble right and then the fact that you mentioned that you know they were on the sidelines both karasuma and koro sensei until the very end right you know until after nagisa had you know you know uh, fake assassinated him so it was quite yeah there was that level of inconsistency there because it's like well they do care about their students but yet how come they didn't 
go in until the very end until Nagisa had actually done something about it you know what I mean that kind of put me off a little bit but I think what was interesting about that episode was we kind of saw Karasuma show a level of weakness he wanted to step down for some reason and it was like he almost accepted it he was like you know what they don't need me this guy is a new guy he's beloved you know what I mean it was just weird it's like I didn't really see that side of the character come out before and I felt it was really out of place well yeah we'll talk about characters and such later but uh Karasuma Sensei was actually a character that I actually ended up enjoying throughout the series mm -hmm. as well so it, it felt just I don't know like I said I just want to keep using the word awkward that whole whole episode that whole sequence of events that went down just went felt very awkward to me but at the same time I kind of understand Koro Sensei why he was one of the ones that was like just you know let's just see how this plays out because he wanted to have faith in the students mm -hmm. he wanted to have faith in the kids to be able to do what they needed to do you know so i kind of get that part though. i get it as well but as you mentioned yes it is quite awkward you know with yourself being a teacher you wouldn't want to put your students in harm and in fact you you want to prevent those situations from occurring even if it is with like an altercation with another teacher or another student or anything like that you kind of want to break those situations situations up it's very interesting though why they had to include that there because they needed to introduce the villain it kind of felt a little bit tacked on if that makes sense you know what i mean no totally i get it you know if he wasn't there and if they didn't have that whole you know fake assassination with nagisa it's revealed that he's in the hotel at the end he's the final right. boss right he's final big boss villain so yep, if yep. he wasn't introduced earlier on in the season then it would have been a bit weird just to introduce this guy and you're like oh who the hell is he i do get it it, it's kind of almost like a deus ex machina in a way the fact that they kind of had to introduce him just to introduce him later on like a callback it's interesting though the place that they put the episode because i remember when i was watching it because it's basically the second core um so this is like episode 13 it's pretty much halfway through the season yeah it's also in the the new op and ed start well i mean the ed doesn't change but it is a new op oh yeah this is the first episode that they decided to like to start the second core it was very very odd because normally you'd get like a summary of what has gone on it might have been a summary episode or anything like that but it was just out of nowhere and this is another thing that i find really odd with assassination classroom as much as i love the show i find at times that every episode well maybe not every episode but a lot of the episodes in this first season just introduces a lot of characters and you see them go in and you see them go out quite quick there are some reoccurring sort of baddies or villains um, every once in a while i think but you don't really see them more than twice within the season right whether we're talking about Takaoka that is a difficult name to pronounce but it is it if, really is if, it, if we're talking about Takaoka right it just felt very convenient that he was introduced in this one episode you don't really care about him in this episode but you know you want to hate him it felt almost like forced you know what I mean like why should I care about him you know why should I care about his relationship to Karasuma because clearly he's doing it to be a dick clearly he's doing it to kind of get under Karasuma's skin to be like look I'm taking your position I'm gonna be the one to assassinate this guy and i'll get a promotion above you so it's clear that he he has some resentment with karasuma but it would have been nice to have seen an altercation maybe like a flashback with him and karasuma maybe in the army right to kind of show why he hates karasuma and then i think i would have respected him a little bit more as a villain well i also thought it was weird like you get a character like that but then also you know part of the way through the show they introduce kuro sensei's brother and his like yes you know guardian i'm like so i was thinking like oh is this the way they're gonna go is this gonna be the villain and then you get to that to the last arc of the show which actually takes place over like the last like six episodes or five or six episodes and it's not i'm like what is this show doing what is going on i find that the show in terms of its story and in terms of the way it's structured it's it's almost designed to throw you off in the same way that koro sensei throws off his students there's so many things that koro sensei does that it's like shit i wouldn't have realized that like you can't predict what happens in assassination classroom at all it's a very unpredictable no. show and i think it's because they throw out certain things that aren't going to be used until second season certain things that aren't going to be used until later on in the season and certain things that are never going to be used at all and you don't know that at the time of watching you don't know what's going to be used at when it's kind of like a candy bag you can pick something out you might get a snickers bar you might get a bag of skittles you don't know what you're going to get but it's it's still quite nice you know what i mean like i really did enjoy those final episodes in terms of
of like my favorites it was a highlight of the season i can't remember i think the episode was episode 20 i think where we kind of get that redemption arc for karma you know after karma kind of fails in the well he doesn't fail but he doesn't do as good as uh koro sensei expected him to do in his exams and he kind of feels a little uh, bit down for that yeah that was in uh in episode 19 and yeah that was that was one of my favorite moments of the show I mean, it was a gr it was a great episode because he he kind of gets that redemption you know when he beats up grip and he just like yep Oh, and but... I like how to like Koro Sensei kind of like knew it was coming. Mm, exactly. And that was also one of the moments where Koro Sensei said, Look, leave him. Let's see where this goes. Yep. And and to be fair with you, is He Koro does that a lot. He does it a lot because he's a teacher, right? He wants his, to see his students grow without him. And that's a theme going on throughout the whole show. But at the same time, what could he have done? There's not much he would have done in that sort of ball state, that marble state, you know, of his, right? He's literally in a glass ball. He can't do shit, even if he wanted to. It which is very interesting to see that level of strategy from Karma. When I watched it originally, I was like, shit, man, Karma's gonna get fucked. When Grip is just hold Karma by the skull, like, I was thinking, this is the end of it for him, right? And then he just flashes him with the gas. So there's a lot of callbacks with previous episodes as well. We don't actually see him take the gas in a previous episode, so you don't really see that as coming, but it's not out of the way. Like, it's not something that I would be like, oh, this is a bullshit answer. Like, he could have easily done it. You know, it's believable in a sense. Some people People might say that's a deus ex machina but at the same time it's like i could believe that happens right especially with karma and the way that his character is that was one of my favorites but i think also the episode before where nagisa or maybe that was the same episode where nagisa was cross-dressing one of my favorites it actually started at the end of that episode and then went into the next episode part of me felt that they put that on because there was a joke within the episode where karma was like hey this is for comic relief and he just takes a picture of him in the uh skirt and top and stuff so part of me thinks that it is designed for comic relief because there's a lot of references in previous episodes like the swimming pool episode where the girls found out that nagisa was a guy for the first time so <laughs> it, it's, yeah. it's stuff like that it's kind of like in bakata test where people don't know about hideyoshi and things like that and that was another thing this show really especially with this comedy really did remind me of bakata test quite a lot yeah i can see that i can see that you know it's also the fact that the way that the school is set up you know you have that really shitty classrooms mm -hmm, for the people that mm -hmm, are mm -hmm. you know yeah. kind of like in the you know that don't have good grades and stuff but you know i'm not it's not it's not back at the test by the way but that was another thing that another episodes that i did like those episodes where you see them studying for tests right i don't know why but i really do love those episodes and and sort of those callbacks within the episodes and like the cutaway gags or those scenes where they're doing the maths test and it's like kind of like almost monster hunter-esque right where they they're fighting these big monsters it's representative of what their challenges are in front of them but in like a, like a dream format a like they're daydreaming you exactly know? i'm taking on, i'm taking on this exam that's so hard and that exam is represented by like a monster hunter like monster yeah yeah just to touch on on that but there's one, one thing i did appreciate about this show is that even though it's this fantastical you know sci-fi kind of story and like you end up having a like you know computer with like guns that pop out of it and like a, a school girl face and all that type of stuff one thing that I, I that i appreciated on top of that though was how a lot of the actual action of the show was kind of grounded outside of kuro sensei himself like the kids were actually learning how to fight how to fight you know like barehanded how to fight with knives how to use firearms like it wasn't everyone having crazy superpowers like even when it came to the to the one guy that they were fighting in the theater with the revolver like he was just like a top tier level soldier is all it was it wasn't like he had some kind of crazy gun kata superpowers mm -hmm. if that makes sense mm -hmm. that was another thing i really loved that episode as well because you also got to see some real world strategies it was great because even though sensei was not in a position to help them physically he was there telling them what to do confusing the enemy like even the decoy like once again it's like how would they have had the time to create a decoy and like like a puppet almost that didn't make much sense but at the same time was just like i don't care i don't care if it makes sense that was really really enjoyable right those weird inconsistencies almost add up together it's just a nitpick of mine in general when it comes to anime i think there's too many anime that take a like mundane premise especially like with sports anime and then add like superpowers and abilities mm -hmm. into it you know i'm mm -hmm. just it's just a, a personal thing of mine that i don't like so i thought that that was really cool that even though this isn't 
than a sports anime it's a school setting and these kids are literally being trained to be assassins how at least some of it was still really grounded like none of the kids learn how to like you know do crazy type super strength abilities or anything like they were all still confined within the limits of like physics and you know the, the strength of a human person you know outside of Kurasuma sensei that is there are certain characters that kind of go beyond that and if we're talking about uh ritsu i believe is her name the the ai character yeah why well, you saying she's a character that can kind of get away with it though because she's not real i know but at the same time there's a lot of inconsistencies with her like okay she's created by the norwegian government first of all i didn't know norway were really into like weapons and shit oh dude scandinavian people they are into anything tech man anything technology oh yeah like they have some they have some of like the best hackers oh, and coders it? in the world too. okay okay well then that makes sense but it was just a bit weird because obviously she becomes sentient and she hides her, a part of herself but then at the same time well wouldn't they have noticed because they had noticed originally wouldn't they have noticed afterwards that she's sort of uploaded herself as an ai to their phones and it seemed a bit like wishy-washy oh yeah yeah yeah, it, that, it was just something that they just totally skipped over. Yeah. You're absolutely right in those regards. <laughs> How did she get the access to, like, the building's maps and, like, know where all the guards were? Like, that was just something that was blown over. I was like, what the hell? Like, But at the same time, it's like one of those shows where you can just turn your mind off and you, you don't really care about the explanations behind things because it's just that entertaining. And I can kind of forgive those sins, effectively. It was just very interesting. But for you, Will, I wanted to know, if you haven't mentioned them already, what were your favorite favorite episodes i'm gonna be a, a little bit biased here and i'll say like episode two was definitely one of my favorites okay episode two the one with uh with tomohito okay the, 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 base, the baseball, baseball player and basically like the the bottom line of that episode was like the, the message of basically you just you have to find your own way mm -hmm. you can't try to copy other people you can you can obviously be influenced and you can be inspired by other people but like i said and I'm a, I'm a big you know baseball fan like i played baseball most of my life growing up so it just really resonated with me plus i, I resonated a lot with tomohito himself so i really uh really enjoyed that episode let's see um i liked you know pretty much any of the stuff where they they took the trips like the kyoto trip and then of course later to okinawa I really liked I, I liked episode 11 just because I loved how they showed where Kuro Sensei's head would get gigantic based on like humidity, which kind of goes hand in hand with how like you find out that he can't really go in water. That's like one of his weaknesses, which kind of makes sense how humidity would affect him as well. So I thought that was a neat little trait. That was also the same episode that they introduced his brother, which I thought at first it felt kind of out of place and it didn't end up going anywhere, at least in season one. But I did think it was a neat dynamic that they did at least introduce into the show. Um, and I loved all the stuff with like the different exams. Like I love the episodes where it was them not just challenging themselves to do better on the exams, but like uh, later in the season where they were trying to beat the A class, be able to like even win this trip to go to Okinawa. And then they like laid out their, their like manifesto where they had like the 50 different rules in the contract that, you know, uh, that E team, I mean, that E class had to beat them or else they were basically going to become subservient to them and that kind of stuff. So... Um, and honestly, I like the episodes where we actually got more about Irina. Irina, how do you pronounce her name? Bitch Sensei. Yeah, Bitch Sensei. I didn't want to say it, but yeah. To, I mean, I really enjoyed where you got to know more about her because I thought she was actually one of the more standout characters of the show too, just for for multiple reasons. Well, And also with Kurasuma Sensei. Like, it's weird. In this show, uh, like I said, I'm really, really biased when it can, comes to the episodes and the characters that kind of go hand in hand for me because I wanted to to know more about the teachers mm -hmm. and i wanted to know more about the baseball playing kid tomohito mm -hmm. uh, that said though i also liked any of the episodes that kind of featured karamu as well okay um because like i said the show kind of hints at nagisa being the main character but it's only like kind of touched on and he just has those interjected moments here and there but i've kind of felt like karamu was kind of like his antithesis character mm -hmm. if that makes sense mm -hmm. so i don't know i just think like any of the episodes
episodes with that kind of dichotomy going on. We mentioned at the beginning, like most of the episodes are basically sort of surrounded around characters learning a lesson from mm -hmm. Koro Sensei and things like that. In fact, a lot of the episodes are named after characters themselves. Episode three is called Karma Time, which is named after Karma uh, Akabane, which is, I think, also one of my favorite episodes, sort of to round off the discussion around favorite episodes and kind of go into characters. It's very interesting because that episode with Karma, obviously we, he's at this point he's introduced as a new character but he clearly doesn't like teachers the reason why he wants to kill him is because he was betrayed by one right he thought that he could do anything as long as his grades were high and i think probably what it was it just shows the corruption that's going on in the school the teachers want the students to get good grades for their own benefit so that they can get promotion or you know like more money and stuff like that so you know he kind of got thrown under the bus probably because you know he was defending a student that was being bullied by a teacher right so that kind of got him punished in a way it was one of the other standout moments to me even though it was really short and brief was in um, episode five and the second half of it with Nagisa actually standing up to the principal mm -hmm. because it was something that I didn't really see coming from him. You kind of see that kind of growth as they go on throughout the show. But going back to Karma, it was it was very interesting because he wanted to test Koro Sensei. He still didn't trust him. And he was just like, you know what? I know that I'm going to kill you some way. I'm going to risk my own life so that I can kill you. And he didn't expect him to do what he did and save him. And I think that sort of bridged the gap a little bit. It kind of opened his heart heart a little bit and made him think well maybe not all teachers are shit and it's one of the reasons why he stayed in the class even after getting 100 percent on the maths exam right so why well, i was saying it, it the overall premise of the show is a little bit awkward to me because it's like by the end of this first season like all the kids are talking about kind of like how grateful they are to the teachers even the ones that did them wrong like takoka sensei like when they thank him you know nagisa thanks him at the end and everything too it's it's so weird because it's like it, it, it's showing how some of these adults have kind of put these kids into these crap situations but the ones that they can tell still care about them that they're only doing it to push them versus the ones that are like looking on their nose at them kind of a thing so it's it's just i don't know how how else to say it other than it's just different let's kind of focus on the teachers first and then on the students because obviously we get more time with the teachers as a whole it's very interesting your thoughts on Karasuma and the fact that you wanted to know more about him because to me Karasuma seems more kind of like your secondary character like for me I want to know more about Koro Sensei at least watching this first season they put a lot of hints right there's that cutaway where you see Koro Sensei basically talking to someone who you presume is dying the person that told them I want you to take care of these kids why who is this woman in relation to the class what is her significance what is the relationship between her and Koro Sensei right there's so many different questions there there, but then at the same time okay what is Koro Sensei why does he have a brother who is this brother it made me think is Koro Sensei like because Koro Sensei mentions it in the episode but I always thought that he's lying you know what I mean because he said I'm an experiment right I'm I'm a synthesized being you know an organic being right but to me that doesn't add up i've always had this kind of feeling that it's kind of like the x23 situation you know like in the x-men you've, you've got wolverine he's part of the weapon x program and you've got x23 who's his clone it kind of feels to me that koro sensei and itona are basically wolverine and x20 at least that's what my initial impression was. i will say <clears throat> that i definitely wanted to know more about Koro Sensei, just like in the same regards as you. I don't necessarily say that I think he was lying, but I also don't think he was telling everything about himself. He was, I mean, the show set that up on purpose to, to make everything be like, what in the world is he? What is going on? Like, you get little tidbits of information of him, but it's like, even when they show the brief little flashback after his brother's introduction, it shows them like swaddled in blankets as babies, and you've got, you know, his brother that, you know, looks like a normal human for the most part, but then you've got, got him with this big Big, weird yellow head sticking out of the blanket i'm like what he was born like it actually showed like i thought like from all the stuff he was saying about him being created is that he came out looking like he did he didn't grow from being a baby but then they show him as a baby but will that's not real that was a joke oh it was yeah that was a I joke didn't catch that that was a joke and they were they moved on to talk about this whole regal story that was just an ex that was like a joke really that wasn't oh, a real I thing i didn't even catch no. that i went way over my head yeah 
because he mentions it, he was like, yeah, he didn't even know he had a brother. So that's kind of gotcha. what made me feel as though he was lying a little bit because because he mentions it. He's like, look, I'm a synthesized being like I'm artificial. I, I you know, I don't yes, exist. Cause I knew from the get go. He wasn't he wasn't an alien. I remember him saying he's like, you know, I'm not an alien. He's like, you know, I, yeah, he says, you know, I come from Earth just like you. It's like, but then at the same time, why did he blow up the moon? What was that? About? That's the thing. There's so many questions. But if you had seen earlier on in the season and the reason why I think uh, Koro sensei is lying is because Karosuma says earlier on in the season he was like he mentioned something about Koro sensei when he had two legs oh you're right he, he throws that you're out right. there and it's something that a lot of people will miss because very early on in the season I think it was like no, episode yeah. 6 so that was he, like the first episode was it I can't remember I think it was the episode where the head teacher came in for the first time it was right before he comes in and he was just talking about it and he said oh I'm not going to bring it up it's too painful for you so that in conjunction with the fact that he said he's a synthesized being made me yeah. feel that it was human experiments yeah that's that, i mean honestly that's what i was was you know thinking from you know, from most of the time that he he i mean the, was, the thing is he still has so many human traits like you know being embarrassed and things mm -hmm. like that like when he's when he's caught like looking at the porno mags and stuff mm -hmm. like that i mean he still has a lot of human in a way it reminds me of momonga from overlord the fact that he, yeah, you yeah. know he's this overpowered being and he still has this human side obviously not full on momonga right but that kind of did remind me of that a little bit it was it was quite interesting this brings me back to you know a why does he want one of these kids to kill him and b if they can't kill him why does he want to blow up the earth like it's it all come down to him being angry but he doesn't really show himself being angry enough to want to blow up the world but is that why he blew up the moon i just like i said so many unanswered questions it's there is i guess i need to see season two to kind of get more of that explanation but yeah it's just it's a roller coaster man when it comes to just kuro sensei by himself he's a roller coaster of a character and i agree with you it is something that you do need to see season two for and i hate saying that and it, it kind of feels like a little bit of a crutch um to say that oh you know what if you want the answers go and see season two but it doesn't kind of feel like that because there's just so many different things that you're left thinking about in a way because the show throws out so much some stuff is bullshit and will never be revealed and will have no significance of the story but because they mixed it in with stuff that actually will drive the story forward for the second season it's like you don't know what's going on and it kind of builds that intrigue and i think that's one of the reasons why i really did enjoy koro sensei as a character is because you don't know who the fuck he is right and you know you could argue the same with karasuma and irina but to me they're not that intriguing because well they're human beings we know karasuma is like working for ministry of defense we know irina is an assassin and we do get quite a lot of um, character development within this season for them but it's just always Koro Sensei like what is he made out of why did they make these special bullets it, it leads me to think if they could make weapons that successfully fight against him it means that they would have created him in a lab uh, an experiment that had gone wrong because how would you find that solution to kill him if you didn't know his weaknesses already but that's also another thing the government have been tracking him for such a long time yet how come they didn't give the student and the fact that they created these anti-sensei bullets and stuff if they knew knew that and they knew his weaknesses to create that ammunition and those knives how come they didn't give the information to the students and how come they're relying on nagisa to find out his weaknesses and things like that they should have already known that and that's what brings me back to like i I've, i thought about this pretty much the whole time while i was watching i had a lot of the same questions that you did and just it, the the title itself being assassination classroom and there's several times during the shows too where like certain kids have their moments and like either Koto sensei is saying it or Kurosuma sensei Kurosuma sensei excuse me is saying it where they look at a kid and they're like this kid is a natural born killer this kid is a natural born assassin like I'm wondering if they are actually training them to eventually be militarized someday like there's so much government involvement in this that that's just in the bin it was in the back of my head this whole time I'm like is this all a setup like is that why they're choosing this kind of like remote school and not just a remote school but mm -hmm. like the class that's shoved away on top of the mountain even not on like the main grounds mm -hmm. of the school like is that what's actually going on here maybe because like it, it look at it look at it when compared to other shows like we already talked about love it's elf like things like you know Mbakasu test and like my hero academia like each of these kids are kind of like specialized in something they're not like superhuman 
but they're trying to help like develop their powers to where they can be like the best of their potential that might be the case but at the same time to to sort of refute that point karasuma already knows what's going on he understands why they've picked the school it's not revealed to us as to why right, let's say all he knows right he knows but, but we don't know that's the thing he knows but at the same time he has his doubts because he goes up to karasuma after the fake assassination of the other teacher i can't remember his name but you know we know who we're talking about what was his name again i just really want to mention his name takauka sensei yeah takauka sensei after the, the assassination on him karasuma goes up to koro sensei and he says what would you do if one of your students said that they wanted to be an assassin karasuma sensei is saying to koro sensei that he's worried about that he doesn't want that to be their future even though that they're, they're skilled at it like if it's not if it's not them themselves but like i said it's because there's like there's so much government involvement there's someone behind the scenes pulling all these strings in the first place it's like not only do they want to stop proto sensei but i'm wondering if they're looking at this for potential for the future you know but then at the same time why would you pick a class of misfits right well you know like i said because they're all still like special at something you know they all have some type of skill somewhere okay. i mean and that's even shown to like during those uh the exams versus a class like where even some of the students who aren't the quote unquote you know brightest of the bright they still manage to to like ace like the home ec exam things like that like they're all able to do something like i said it's just it's just little things that i'm you know i don't know if they're a part of the story or not because i don't know beyond I can't say one, but problem. it's just things it's just things that th that this first season had me thinking while i was watching it um i'm also intrigued to know your views on irina sensei because you mentioned that she's a very intriguing character at times she is kind of portrayed as the sort of fan service character the sexy character effectively but she's more than that that, right because you know she's in a way she's like um i don't know it kind of is very reminiscent of like you know the bond films like you have that femme the fatale bond girl. yeah the bond girl or the femme fatale right the assassin effectively that kind of goes in seduces a man to kill him or to get information but she's more than that even right it's almost as if the author has included this character as like a parody of the Bond girls, in a way. Oh, absolutely! Yeah, she's I mean, she's a parody of a, of a Black Widow. I think they even like mention her. In they this, did. They did mention scene. it, and she got yeah. angrier at it. She's like, "Don't call me that." <laughs> like, she, yeah, she finds it funny, but she's more than that, right? Because she shows her ability, her skills. You know, the fact that she can speak multiple languages, the the fact that she can play the piano, and the, these are kind of mundane skills. But she shows them how to use them, how to get into these situations, how to get out of situations, combat skills as well. So she is very proficient she's not just a pretty face and i think that's very interesting that they've kind of included that there and the fact that there's a lot of female characters a lot of the girls in the class actually really look up to her you know and they mention you know it's not because she's sexy woman or because she's got big breasts or anything like that it's because she's a badass and i kind of really well, like, like that in anime see, right see you, you you asked me this question you're like you want to what are your thoughts on arena sensei and then you're like just stealing all my thunder right i'm now. sorry i'm sorry i had to say it yeah i mean that's like i said she was one of my favorite characters you know because of of just the different levels of her i mean yes from from the get-go she was portrayed as you know the sexy you know black widow super spy type character and everything but they also humanized her very much where like she got upset easy you know and like she showed her emotions like she got angry easy and everything and like when she first you know was shown as being a teacher she wasn't taking the teaching aspect of it really like serious at all but then the students kind of like stepped up to her and you know they started telling her what they did and didn't like about working with her and having her as a teacher and when she actually uh, started taking the teaching seriously that's when i think it really kind of like opened up more of a, a level to her that you know was beyond what you got on the surface like um like she had a little bit of everything she was part of the comedy relief she was part of the sex appeal and the fan service but like you said she also had the connection with the female uh students in the class but it wasn't just the females even some of the boys were even connecting with her and like you know basically just being honest with her and that's what what i really liked about her character is that it ended up becoming this whole balance of being honest with herself and being honest with the students and the students in turn being honest with her um and then i also did like how they actually got 
like to show some of her actual skills as being a spy and an agent along the way like where like she was seducing the men at the hotel and playing the piano and pretending to be drunk you know it was just there was a lot of different moments like that throughout the whole show that I just really enjoyed like I enjoyed pretty much every time that she was on screen whether it was for fan service or whether it was for actual narrative and I think it's very rare to see in anime um characters that are more than just fan service right because I don't know like sometimes it kind of gets I look I know a lot of people love fan service but I think sometimes some anime especially shonen shows can overdo it to the point where like I really hate this character because they're all just about fan service and there's no nuance to them and there's no they're kind of like a shell if that makes sense so it's nice to see that she's actually a character that actually uh, contributes to the story but also it's just a good character and it's just a badass and I think we need more badass characters especially badass female characters in anime you know but yeah you also mentioned Karasuma because I don't have much to say about him but I'm really intrigued why you relate to him obviously you are a teacher by profession as well it was just one of those things where to me he was a typical character in a non-typical show okay he was your your cool calm you know for the most part uh just badass character um and like he took both being an agent and trying to be this like uh, authoritative teacher figure very seriously that even though they had he still had this ultimate goal of trying to beat or kill Kuro Sensei in the background he still had obvious care for the kids and like took many of them under his wing like uh, wanting to protect them as well and wanting them to grow like and he I like how he he was able to notice things in other people like going from you know the things that he remembered from the cow sensei to cut dang it that name <laughs> to cow sensei to arena sensei you know to uh karuma and nagisa like he he really paid attention so you could he could tell that he cared as much about being a teacher as he did also being a government agent like i said he was just to me again a a typical grounded cool badass character in in an anything but typical situation that's quite interesting uh, you know to me i didn't quite see it like that in, in all fairness like he he was quite an unassuming character it was nice that we saw more in terms of his story arcs and stuff like that but i don't know he was just as you mentioned he was just a character that was there for me the more interesting characters i will say for me like in terms of my favorite character is karma big fan of him just because of the amount of strategy that he uses nagisa i'm into as well but i find that nagisa at least in this season uses the same tactics again and again it was very nice the first time you know that sort of unassuming people think he's cute he's not going to do any damage he goes up basically for a hug how many times has he's done that in this season at least three times right and it kind of feels like it's his crutch effectively like after the first time would you imagine that it would work the second time the fact that he's used it on Takauka sensei twice during the initial assassination and then the second assassination it's like nagisa do you not have any more fucking ideas you just use the same thing more than once and i find that they kind of play on that a lot with nagisa that kind of unassuming tactician type of character but you'd imagine imagine that a tactician would use more than one strategy I, I find that he just uses the same strategy multiple times and that's why i like karma because karma is very creative right the fact that his initial meeting with koro sensei he put he cut up the knife and he put it in his hand for the handshake and then other times you know he'd put these knives on the floor or he would put the the bbs on the floor and things like that like he knew how to catch koro sensei off guard and i think that's probably why koro sensei is taking the shining to him right he he likes his creativeness right because Oro sensei as a character is also incredibly creative in what he does and, and things like that the other characters for me are quite unassuming i mean there's quite a lot of characters in the show and i think that might be also its downfall but it's kind yeah. of expected in a way because it is a classroom so you can't really ignore characters right. but the fact that there's just so many you don't get much character development other than you know karma nagisa i would say a lot a lot of the other students just had like little moments moments here or like there was a couple episodes where it was like a split episode where like the first half would be about this one character who hadn't done anything you know other than just make appearances finally gets a moment and then the next half would be you know like a continuation of the main story or another character i think in terms of the side characters the one that we kind of get more character development on is sugino the the baseball player and uh terasaka the the guy that betrayed them the judas of this anime i, I was going to mention mention him as well like he get 
it's that that development and a little bit of flashback at the end of it but even then like his isn't that deep and then no i say like tomohito the baseball player he has a couple moments like the, between episode two and then later when they're you know actually playing in the the baseball game against the 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 class a kids mm-hmm. and everything mm-hmm. but as far as students go just like you i was mostly interested in uh karma the most and like i had the same impressions of nagisa as well so like we're pretty much tracking the same there one thing that i didn't like like okay i'm a big fan of uh okajima the the kind of skinhead kid he's a kid that when they go to the uh, assembly for the first time like he gets like i was just pissing myself laughing he's a comic relief character basically but oh it was he the one that that stripped and in the final episode went to go jump in the water with the girls can't remember it sounds like something that he would do but i remember he was drowning when they were trying to cross the river he got attacked by snakes uh, he got swarmed by bees like all the bad shit was happening to him and it was just like a trope that all this crazy shit would happen to him and then another character that in terms of it wasn't necessarily character development but it's a character that we see with nagisa a lot is a uh, kaide hayano uh, the girl with the green hair yeah, with the green hair yeah i, I kind of feel bad when it when it comes to her because most people know me know that I have like a thing for green haired mm-hmm. anime girls mm-hmm. like if there's one around they're usually my favorite character but something about her like I just I'm not gonna say she was flat out annoying but something about her just annoyed me yeah she she is quite an, of an annoying character it feels like she's just narrating everything that Na- Nagisa does it was just weird but I think also at the same time I don't know how she was supposed to be portrayed because she also feels like a punching bag for jokes like Okay, Koro Sensei mentioned made a joke that she's flat chested. Fine. I get it. I'm not a fan of it, but I, I understand that joke, right? But it kind of feels like that's her main character trope that she's flat chested. And I'm like, why, why are we beating a dead horse here? I thought too, because of the fact that she, since they always showed her like in class with Nagisa, mm-hmm. that there was something going to be developed with like them. Mm-hmm. I don't want to necessarily say like romantic, but mm-hmm. them just being close. And it was one of those things like Nagisa would be around, but she would just happen to like pop up behind him. Yeah. Like you said with the narration and stuff like that. I'm like, what? This isn't really anything. What's yeah. Going she's, on with her? In a way, she's like a non character. And I find it's the same with a lot of these other side characters. Like they're very interesting in terms of their character design. Like all of them look very different, right? But at the same time, it's like, do I really care about them? Like I don't care about Kotaro uh, uh, Takashi by Bayashi he said some he's the guy with the uh, glasses you know the trope the anime trope of the weeb effectively or the otaku basically the guy with the, mm-hmm. the glasses and the, the glasses fog and stuff he mentioned one joke that kind of it's a trope in itself but when he was talking about uh, 2d girls are better than 3d girls and that kind of stuff and you know all the characters are varied and they're tropes within themselves and they look very different which is very rare in anime the fact that you have a very diverse cast of characters that isn't just different hair colors they look very different their head shapes are different their eyes are different their, their facial structures are different as well so you can see that and, and the fact that it's not just their hair uh, hair colors it's their hairstyles and the way that the characters speak as well it's not like some anime like i don't know for example haganai right you could shave off the heads of all of the characters and they'd look exactly the same right but it's very varied in this show and i, I really do like that i think that tends to be a very lurch kind of thing too mm-hmm. especially with with this crew like you said when we were talking about the different shows they make a lot of their their shows that they've made have all had that kind of similar style when it comes to to, to character design they're all very unique and stand out from one another in some form or another speaking into that i just wanted to kind of dip into our uh, audio visual component of the episode and actually talk about art style because that's very interesting that you mentioned that the art style for me was very reminiscent of danganronpa and i've mentioned this in my notes the characters have very bold and sharp outlines which allow them to yep. pop amongst all the different colorful scenes and backgrounds and to be fair with you will i didn't really expect a detailed and colorful scenery like this in this sort of anime right especially in the shonen show where the majority of scenes are taking place in the classroom at least for the first half of the season you know it was That's exactly it, what i was talking about back you know when, when i was talking about my first impressions like i said it's an art style that i personally really like and you know what i i another thing that i will mention about the animation is lurch has done an incredible job right they've gone all out with the cutaway gags with koro sensei the transitions as well and you know what I will say this props to them because it can be very 
very, very difficult to convey a level of emotion with a character that doesn't have facial expression. That I thought was incredible. Yes, there are times in which Koro Sensei does get angry and he has that heavy breathing and you see the veins pop out of his head. But a lot of the time, Koro Sensei's emotions are shown through his body language. It's shown how he walks or how, you know, his his face will change color and things like that or the way that he talks. And, you know, it's, it's very interesting, right? Like his movements, especially in his tentacles, show a range of emotions that it's unheard of in anime. It, it just it doesn't happen. Another thing I will mention is that animation in this show, I don't know if you've noticed as well, it's very, very smooth to the point that I could not tell the difference between what was CG because there is CG in this anime and there's quite a lot of it. I couldn't tell the difference between what was 3D animated and what is 2D animated, which as you guys know on Kunai, I always like to say this, good 3D animation is 3D animation that you don't notice. That's just how it is. It doesn't stick out like a sore thumb, which is excellent. And the fight scenes and the assassination attempts were great, especially when, you know, those scenes where you see Koro Sensei's flying or traveling at like Mach 20. The animation is produced in a way where you can really feel that speed without dropping or skipping frame. So props to Studio Lurch on that one. I'll somewhat agree. I mean, I think that the animation was good, but it's also nothing that I'm going to, you know, like... Uh champion for or anything okay. like that I just, so like there were some scenes especially with Cardo sensei when it was like not in an action scene where it was like there was a lot of you could tell just voiceover work with still images like when they were just like, talking and things like that and there were other times that i noticed where like a lot of times when there was uh, i i guess i would call it a post action bit like uh times where a character would grab another character and they would be sitting there like monologuing or something like that and like the faces weren't the best on the characters mm -hmm. like, i mean just little nitpicky stuff like i said okay. it was good i'm not going to complain about the animation of the show whatsoever i did i do think it's good animation but i also don't think it was amazing either okay okay no okay i will disagree with you i mean i do understand your point but for me especially with the shonen show like you kind of look more towards the fight scenes and the action scenes and things like that and they were great for me and i think they were better than some shonen that exist nowadays you know what i mean the the show itself has definitely held up since the you know seven years since it first came out and everything don't get me wrong like you said it's good it's just like i said it's nothing that's gonna be like oh man you've got to check out this animation i'm not gonna tell people to check out the show for that but yeah in, in regards to the voice acting it's got some very famous voice actors but I, that, that's not what i want to talk about i want to talk about the resurgence of the show because as you know it's been airing on tsunami the dub more than maybe six years later from the original release which is very unusual usual for Toonami to pick up a show that isn't as hyped as it is now you know what I mean I really don't know I mean I can't really explain a reason why other than maybe they thought like it was just something that it's like well it's been some time since you know anyone has maybe seen this maybe mm -hmm. it's time to introduce this to a new audience like for instance um I know back when uh Yashahimi was was airing that there were people going back uh and rechecking out Inuyasha for okay. instance so maybe they thought it was something that since they already had like connection to with assassination classroom it might have been something that they thought you know from a cost aspect something since it already had a dub made that they could just put out there and maybe garner some more attention you know or maybe get back some people who might have you know not been checking out the block in a while like i know there's been a lot of stuff going on with cartoon network and tsunami mm -hmm. too so maybe it's just something they thought like i said there was just a i don't want to say a cheap investment but something that might be worth the time i will go as far as to say that it might be a cheap investment that, that funimation did probably sub license to tsunami because of the fact that well this show probably isn't doing so well in terms of streaming because i remember when we originally watched it for kunai it was difficult to find right it was only because obviously crunchyroll wasn't bought out by funimation at the time but they had a they were sharing licenses because they did that partnership a few years back and you can get it on crunchyroll and you can get it on funimation but it was like it was a, just a lot easier to watch on funimation but at the time in the uk it wasn't on funimation it was only on crunchyroll it was just a mess to watch and licensing and distribution of anime is just it's so wonky it is and it's not getting any better to be fair with you i don't really want to get into it as much now but yeah it's just gotten worse over the years like the fact that yes it's easy to watch on crunchyroll now but you know back then it was just it was a mess just trying to watch this show and it's nice that 
Toonami has taken it on because you know when when it just randomly got onto Toonami it was trending people were like excited to watch the show week on week like it wasn't a show that was obviously shown daily it was literally as if it was being simulcasted again there was hype it was trending on Twitter like outside of the anime community because this is one of the ways to get anime and make it accessible is by putting well, I it honestly on Toonami. think it's probably a good move to do too because how we've talked about in you know other episodes and not even when recording we're just you know talking uh amongst ourselves how like there's been this whole like anime and manga explosion just over the past you know few years even before covid like mm-hmm. it was really starting to get big i would say probably like 2017 2018 like before covid even kicked off type thing so it's a good idea i think too for them to take you know an older series like this and just put it out there it's one of those things like we use the expression you know throw shit at the wall and see what sticks Mm -hmm. so if it's something that they already have like in their library something that they already have that they can distribute you know put it out there and see you know see who buys it yeah i I completely agree and you know what considering that this is such an old show and i i know it's 2015 but the way that anime fans are changing they would consider this show to be in the stone ages right so considering that this is an older show at least by their standards i would like to see the show maybe be sub licensed to other people like netflix you know because toonami has brought it very made it very accessible but at the same time we're talking about toonami in america it's not available in toonami in the uk because that's not really a thing anymore but if they were to introduce it on netflix either sub or dub kind of like what they're doing with demon slayer kind of like what they're doing with IQ and things like that this show could see a further resurgence it's just a shame though because there is only two seasons there isn't much manga to kind of go off of but that leads me into well would you want to see a second season of the show knowing what you know from the first season so here's here's the thing like you know you know me i'm i'm far from an anime elitist i like almost anything that i watch like if i finish a show that means that i enjoyed it like i'm type of person that i'll get deep into a show and if something happens like even if i'm eight nine ten episodes in i'll drop it if something makes me not like it anymore the fact that i finished the show wasn't just for this just for our recording but because i did enjoy the show do i think it's the best show ever out there no i do want to see a second season just because there's so many unanswered questions that I want to see if they ever come to fruition. That being said, I'm not going to turn right around and run out and and watch the second season you know, right away. It'll probably be a while before I get to second season. But long story short, yes, I do want to see the second season. Well, that's disappointing. You know why? Because I remember after I finished this episode, initially for Kunai, after I'd finished watching the first season and we'd realized that, oh, we're not going to do this anime anymore. I was just like, fuck it. I'm going to watch second season. I was not disappointed. I will say that second season, in my personal opinion, I don't know if we'll ever do it on Kunai, but I'm just going to say this right from the bat. The second season answers a lot of the questions that we mentioned in this episode. Like, what is Koro Sensei? Who is Koro Sensei? Why does he want to, you know, destroy the earth? Well, and, and let me just say, it's it's not because of anything, any kind of disdain or anything towards the show. It's just that, like I've I've you know said here a couple times, this is a show that's kind of out of my wheelhouse. It's one of those things where it's like I kind of want to have to like get in the mood for it if that okay. makes sense so right. it's like I'll watch more of my you know kind of standard fare and shows that I know that I like and other shows that I've got on my deep 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 backlog and then I'll be like you know what now I'm in the mood to watch second season you're not hyped to find out more about Koro Sensei you're not intrigued enough to watch the second season right away not right away no okay that's very interesting because that's completely different for me because literally I went and watched it straight away. I was like, hell yeah, I'm down for this. I binged it like you said, straight don't, away. Don't take, don't take it as me I'm a, not I'm offended. enjoying no, the show. Me. No, no, of course. I mean, everyone has a different opinion, but I didn't expect that to be fair with you. But interesting. Okay, cool. I'm just going to say, so I think the show is solid. I don't have much that I can really, you know, knock against the show without getting nitpicky and okay, sounding cool. like I'm some 
anime elitist, which I'm not. It's just also one of those things like I'm not going to make it a priority. Which is understandable. I mean, there's other shows out there and if it's not to your taste, then that's that's completely fine. Would you recommend it to someone? And if so, who would you recommend this show to? Honestly, I mean, if I, and I don't mean this to, to be derogatory, but I would definitely recommend this to the like Toonami crowd. Okay, definitely. Like your, I would recommend it to your general anime fan. I would recommend it to people who like shows like uh, Baka to Test. Um, like I said, I think it's a really good comparison to it after you brought it up. So, I mean, I honestly, I don't think there is any one particular type of person that I would not recommend it to. You know what I mean? Like if someone came to me and said, hey, have you seen Assassination Classroom? Do you think I should watch it? I'd be like, hell yeah, check it out. Yeah, I agree with you. But at the same time, if someone came up to me and asked me, Fish, should I watch ass class i'll be like hell yeah watch it but it's not a show that i'd go out of my way and say guys you need to watch ass class i find it's like a hidden gem if you happen to come across it definitely watch it but yeah exactly that's that's a great way to put it like I, i'm not gonna come out there if someone says to me oh what anime do you recommend the first thing that pops in my head isn't gonna be assassination mm -hmm. classroom mm -hmm. but if someone asks me should i watch it i'll be like yes check it out exactly and it, it, i think the reason why i say that is because i can't figure out who this show is for to me initially it kind of feels like this show was made for readers of shonen jump because there's just so much so many references to other shonen jump ip and stuff right but at the same time it's like i can't Kind of find that in terms of the story issues that we've mentioned before these are story issues that are very common within a lot of shonen jump ip and within a lot of shonen shows in general and i find that if you are a shonen fan you're kind of gonna look past those things right you know stories well, I think are the most important one of those shows shows too that like if you're already into that kind of shonen jump stuff you're probably already checking this one out exactly yeah 100 percent. but yeah if you are someone that's into romance anime then definitely this is not a show for you to watch or if you're into comedy not so much but if you are a shonen fan yeah definitely give this show a try like i've spoken to a lot of people that have seen ass class and, and stuff like that and they forget about the show quite easily right they forget about the show they're like oh yeah it was all right and i don't know why that was I, i'll kind of figure out and sort of dig a little bit deeper but i hate saying this on kunai and i mentioned it before but this isn't the season to watch of assassination classroom like it it kind of feels like to me with Haganai in a sense that you watch the first season to get to the second season and yeah this is a, one there of those was shows. another show that we talked about not long ago where it's like the same thing it's like you have to get through first season to get to the actual meat and potatoes i can't remember what it was i don't think it was Haganai. it was something else we were talking about but anyway was it a show that we covered on kunai i don't remember i just remember us having a conversation very similar i to remember this that about, combo about as well oh shit what was it anyway bes that's besides the point before we end this episode thank you will for coming on as always it oh was, yeah my pleasure as always it was always an excellent episode where we got to speak about pro sensei as well as uh, assassination classroom as a whole and i want to thank our sponsors crunchyroll you can obviously watch this on crunchyroll which is fantastic and crunchyroll has been helping us out recently in terms of going to film premieres and giving us early access to certain shows and anime films so shout out to crunchyroll there uh also shout out to our other sponsor sugoi mart will what is the next episode of kunai i do believe we are going to be doing rail wars hell yeah rail wars a fantastic show i don't want to say much into it but will you're going to be taking the reins on that one and i'm looking forward to it what you're taking the reins yeah have you never heard that expression why me because you're, you're, you're so su much better you suggested it so you're going to be hosting it that's the rules that's the rules of kunai <laughs> so all right, I take it back. What what up? What uh? What episode are we doing next, Bish? I thought we we're doing Rail Wars. <laughs> are we not? Yeah, are we not doing no. Rail Wars? <laughs> we're we're doing Rail Wars. Okay, I'm we're doing Rail Wars. You. So I'm really looking forward to it. To be fair with you, it's um. I will say this: it's a show that I thoroughly enjoyed. I can't remember when when did it come out because it was just like another one oh, of those hidden man. gems. Like people forget. It about feels that show like it's lot. been forever. I don't know. I want to say is this is it is it like 2012, 2013? No, I don't think it's that old. I is don't it really? Hang on, hang on. Let me let me look real quick. Let me let me actually look. I'll pull this up really really fast. All right, let's see. It. Oh, 2014. When did, was it 2014? 2014. Okay, so I, I I said 2013. I was I was a year off. You were a year off, but you know what? You, all right, it, it's an interesting one because that that show, if you look online, it doesn't get the best ratings. 
<laughs> no, not at all. But here's the whole thing. Like, even some of my personal favorite shows that, like, I even have, like, in, like, my top ten shows, they're, like, six out of ten shows. But that's that's the beauty of anime. You can have a show that's rated low and it still be your favorite. Like, we know my all-time favorite anime is New Game. And even, like, on my own personal page, I have it rated basically an eight out of ten. But it's my all-time favorite anime. Exactly. I think, you know what? That's the beauty of anime, though. It's like one, one man's trash is another man's treasure. No, I, I'm not saying that the anime is trash. I'm just saying, you know, it's it just tends to be like that, you know. Um, well, regardless, it's going to be a fun episode and a nice fun watch soon. I'm hoping I so. I look forward to it. Also, before we end the episode, did you know that the studio of Rail Wars also did interspecies reviewers? No. I, di I didn't know that. Oh, but my they did. Gosh. So that's something that we're going to be talking about 100% Wait, in the episode. Is it is it is it Passion? Yeah. So there who also took over the reins for uh, High School DxD. Correct. Excuse me, High School DD. I'm going to keep this in the episode. Is it High School DD or High School DxD? Because everyone calls no, it, it is. It is actually pronounced High School DD. Is it? Is it the same with Hunter Hunter? Yes. Okay, because I know Hunter Hunter, just like just like with Spy Family. It's mm. not Spy X Family. It's Spy Family. I don't care. I don't care if people pronounce it the X because the X is there. But like the X in this regards when it comes to a Japanese title it's just it basically it represents like an ampersand that okay. you don't pronounce so really it would be like high school d and d but it's just said high school dd See, like now, spy and family spy family so for me the spy family when people call it spy x family i'm like no don't get out of here don't call it that but if uh, that, that, that doesn't bother me when people it, say bo that, it bothers but, me you know. But if someone said high school DXD, I'm fine with it because apparently everyone calls it that. I haven't met anyone that's called it high school DD. Everyone's called it high school DXD. Yeah, but well, so uh, <laughs> I'm just going to say uh, last year we had a student who had uh, some manga confiscated from him for a day because one of the volumes that he brought in was high school DD. Hell yeah. What a chat. So, uh, but anyway, that's how, you know, he pronounces it is high school DD. Okay. Okay. We'll, we'll listen to him on this one. We'll We'll listen to him on this one but yeah that's been this episode of kunai i hope you guys have enjoyed this episode and stick around for rail wars i don't know what's going to be coming after rail wars because i haven't decided yet but stick around for rail wars we'll announce it then you haven't decided i see how it is no i have because it's my suggestion that's how it works yeah yeah i know i'm giving you a hard time yeah i know come on bitch yeah okay cool Ooh. it's 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 past your I'll, bedtime i'll remember it is past, past my bedtime i'll remember <laughs> that when we get into the rail wars episode i'm gonna give you a hard time i'm gonna find your waifus and i'm gonna ruin them don't tell me who your waifu is will because i will find a way to ruin your wife i don't even know who my rail wars waifu is yet uh, we, we'll, we'll decide i mean when we go and do we'll the, figure it out we'll figure it out 100 anyway that being said bye have a nice rest bish thanks that sounds like you're gonna kill me like i'm gonna die never never anyway sleepy time Bye-bye. Bye-bye.